The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to be discussing farmers markets, what you need to know before you go, as well as ways to improve the production of your garden this year. And our guest is homesteader and author Angela Ferrero. Fanning will be with us and will answer your garden questions. The hour is full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy you've chosen us to take part in your day. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your pro- your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. Thank you for tuning in, whether you're listening to us on one of the 20 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2023. Through a radio app, through our parent website, which is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com, underneath the season seven tab at the top of the page, in studio video replay, podcast download. Thank you very much for taking a little time out of your day to allow us to be part of it. If you want to be part of the program, you can do that in a couple of ways. One by sending us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call, 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. Well, farmer's markets are all the rage, and now's the time. There's some farmer's markets that goes year-round, but right now is the time in which farmer's markets would be beginning to uh, pop up around your area. Yeah, a lot of people now are even like doing farmer's markets dates. Um, what is that? It's like where you meet somebody and instead of like, meeting for... Like, like a Tinder bumble thing? Yeah. Okay. Instead, <laughs> instead of meeting for like coffee or a drink, you're like, let's meet at this farmer's market. And then that girl, way... Girl you, for farmer or whatever it no, is. No, no, like you meet there. Are you, and then that way you have something... In, in, in the hopes of falling in love and is that yeah. the, the... Okay. All yeah. Right. That's, Continue. You know, that's how... That's where know, we're at in society like, now. Well... Yeah, things have changed and evolved, uh-huh. and that, that's fine. But also, people are moving away from dating apps. But that's a different Look conversation. Look at that carrot. Boy, will you marry me? <laughs> that's how our first date went. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, it so- did not. It did not. But- <laughs> All right. So, what do you want me like? They'll be like, what? Okay. So, anyway, uh, farmer's markets are fun. I think they're fun, uh, and I think that... You, everybody should at least try to go to one. Well, how do, how does one know if a farmer's market is even in their vicinity, their, their neighborhood, their city? So you can find out a couple of ways. If you're in any of those like buy, sell trade groups on Facebook, you can ask, you know, they're, they're, those are usually community based. Otherwise some, I think there's like neighborhood apps, things like that, that people can So essentially ask just ask them. somebody. But you can also just search, go to your favorite search engine and type, in farmer's market in your city or your zip code and it's going to tell you um sometimes you can find out from your tinder date maybe Uh perhaps if they tell you that they want to go to the farmer's market um but yeah those are some good ways you can also call your city hall okay because a lot of times they are um i mean they have to have permission to use some sort of city so call your municipality head head office yeah whatever you want to call it uh, yeah. yeah. And now once we've figured all that out, first of all, farmers markets are not just beets, potatoes, cabbage, and lettuce. There's a lot of different things a farmer's market has besides just vegetables. Um, right. So you they have everything from vegetables, obviously. Sometimes they have other things like honey, eggs. Flour flour cheese meat meat um and then so then they have the, so they'll have like what do you call it? like whole foods where it's like like i said the, ing- the ingredients foods sometimes mm-hmm. they have and then some of them even have hot food or food trucks right. or um desserts cupcakes things it's like an that. experience <laughs> it is that's why it makes a good date okay yeah so and then some of them even have live music right so there, there's that option, and, too. and it's not always on Saturday morning. No, 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 no. It's not always on Saturday morning. So there's also like Sunday morning farmers markets. There's or Sunday farmers markets, but then like the one near us here at our 
at our uh, at the studio. Home. Yeah, the studio is, I think it's like on Tuesday. At yeah, Tuesday day. evening or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Two to six or something like that. Uh, so it's it, they're all around. They're... There, and, there, and there's ways in which if you want to partake and be part of the farmer's market and get a hold of your soul, city municipality and figure out the rules and regulations in regards to that. Uh, but when you go to a farmer's market, what are some things in which one should be sure to pack along? Yeah, so you probably want to bring cash, even though we're moving to a, a cashless society. A lot of these vendors want cash. Because there's service fees with your credit card. Or your debit card, there's there's a certain amount of percentile in which they lose. So by you giving them twenty dollars, they don't lose three percent of that. And off because the off the top, because all of these people are looking and trying to save every penny they can, because that's what keeps them alive and surviving. If you've never been part or uh, been engaged in a farming operation. Every little move you make is calculated to know how much you're going to save in order to see what you have profitable at the end of the year. Absolutely. So you want to bring cash. You also want to consider um, bringing your own bags if possible because if they put it in a bag for you, that's another yep, another, another fee expense. or expense yeah, that they have to, they have to um, endure. So you can, you can bring your own bag if possible. And then... Um, and, and, I've seen people bring like wagons. Yeah. So that's an option to. Uh, you can talk to the farmer. You can ask for a potential sample. <laughs> they're people too. I mean, if you if you never had a ground cherry, yeah, they will. I mean, obviously they're not going to let you gnaw into a cabbage, uh, but you know they there's certain um, unique vegetables or fruits in which they may be growing that you've never had, and they have an area or an uh, available sample of it, so you know, hey, I do like that. I'm going to buy two cartons of it. Or so you're not buying something you don't like. Absolutely, and um, I think the first time I had a ground cherry was at a farmer's market. I remember the vendor vendor. Um, they were like, "You want to try this?" And I'm like, "What is it?" And they're like, "It's a ground cherry." And I'm like, "Okay, I don't know what to expect." And then I was like, "These are delicious." So, um, so yeah, that's where I I tried ground cherries for the first time. And then also, as you interact, I took pictures of. Um, some of the vegetables and flowers and this farmer was like, can you print those out and mm -hmm. send those or give them to me? So I did that, which was an experience because I don't usually print out a lot of my pictures. What's that mean? <laughs> but I was glad to do it. So I just dropped them off the next week. Yeah, or I, I tell um, our niece and nephew after, after we take a picture of them with the phone. Hey, when we were growing up, you and your mom, we had to wait two weeks to find out if we had our eyes open or closed. Yeah. Because you had to send it off, and it went. Um, and sometimes you didn't get your pictures back. You got a, a monkey riding a horse. We got that once. You did? Yeah. Shut up. It was mixed in with our picture. A <laughs> monkey was riding a horse. Yeah. That's like a gift. Yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> All right. 1992. So, yeah. Uh, I, got, I got a picture of somebody's dogs on yeah. a digital printout. Yeah. Um, so you, you can you can talk to the farmer. You can ask for samples. You can interact with them. You can ask. Farmers markets are a great place in order to buy in bulk, in quantity. If you're going to can tomatoes or if you want a lot of sweet corn, you can get, I bought 24 years of sweet corn for $8 one time, so a whole box. I said, it, it was, I forget what they named it. It wasn't sweet corn. It was cooking corn or something. I said, what's the difference? I think it was canning corn. Canning corn. Canning I, corn maybe. Yeah. And I said, what's the difference between this and sweet corn? Nothing. We just got too much of it. And I said, I'll buy a whole box. He said, $8. And I ended up, I went home and counted 24 years. Of sweet corn for eight dollars. You can't, you can't even steal that much from the big gawk store, for you know. Put in your pants. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> you cannot get that. But it, that is a great place in order to buy in quantity. Uh, whatever you're trying to. Maybe we should clarify that you're not stealing corn. Not stealing from the, corn, from but the big box store. But yeah. that's a heck of a deal. Eight. Now this was like four years ago, but I'm there's still that uh, availability at farmers markets that you can buy in quantity. You can buy in bulk. And uh, if you want something, like if you've bought flour before, spelt flour, was that what it is? Um, and, and you asked, hey, I would like this. And they say, we don't have it here, but come back next week and we will bring sorghum. extra sorghum. Yeah. And we will bring you extra, bring extra for you. And that's how you can also do it as well, that you can put an order in and, and do it that way. So if you've never been to a farmer's market, boy, you're missing out and you should go whether it's just a block party at your uh, little village or it is a massive park. Oh, one thing I want yes, to mention 
is you want to shop around. Yes. Um, especially if it's a larger farmer's market, you might go up to the first vendor and you see some carrots and they're like $4 for the bunch. But then you might move along and you see, and maybe you see like another farmer and there's like a better, better price perhaps. You can shop around a lot of times. It won't be crazy time. difference, but no. there's subtle differences. Right, right. So when uh, when you do that, you're going to have a good time. Walton's also can provide you a good time, Holly, with uh, their cute, their discount and the quality and the the quality of their products. Absolutely. So we are brought to you today by Walton's. We know you care about where your food comes from, canning, preserving your fruits and vegetables. But at Walton's, you can get all the equipment, seasoning, and supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any other meat product your way to your high standards. I just made chili recently, and I used some of the, the Walton's seasoning. But they can also help you process the meat. You want to make some sn- snack sticks or Beef Jerky, they have this website called MeatGistics.com, an informational site to help you go from animal to edible. They have meat grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers, again, seasonings. Um, you can get anything you need there for everything but the meat. And that's Waltonsinc.com, and the educational site is MeatGistics.com. So if you go to Waltonsinc.com, you can use code GROW50 to save 10% off orders of $50 or more. When we come back, ways to improve the production of your garden. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Grip6 produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have high-quality and durable products that last a lifetime. They're built beyond tough. Their wool socks come from Rocky Mountain source materials, are soft and comfortable, keep your feet warm and dry, and come with a lifetime guarantee. Even for the most sensitive toes, these socks are made for everyone. High quality wool socks make a huge difference for happy feet. They fit in with all the many things you do from around the house to the outdoors and beyond. They are comfortable and long lasting. These socks are great for gardening because they keep your feet so comfortable no matter the conditions outside. It's hard to overstate how amazing these feel to have warm dry feet as you work in your garden. Designed and manufactured in-house for the best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American made manufacturing. Check out their belts, wallets, and socks at grip6.com. Use coupon code RADIO15 to save 15% off your order at grip6.com. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at dripworks.com. Worried about watering too much or too little? Tree diaper technology is the best way to stabilize your soil moisture in your garden, trees, or house plants. Use coupon code GARDEN15 to save 15% off at treediaper.com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural based animal repellent to keep deer and rabbits away from your valuable plants that is odorless after 30 minutes and dries clear. It creates a continuous invisible shield to protect your plants. Works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Will not clog your sprayer. Apply to your property without environmental damage. You can spray directly onto your plants up to flowering, then apply around your plants to continue protection. No need to reapply. Money back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use coupon code RADIO to save 10% off your order. Aqua-Mart.com has everything you need for eye-pleasing outdoor water features on your property. For over 25 years, we've been creating and field testing beautiful water features in order to provide you with the most reliable products and best value in the industry. From easy-to-install pond and water fill kits to pumps, fish food, and more, you'll find everything you need to install and maintain a naturally balanced water feature in your yard. Make your backyard a true oasis and maintain it well. Visit aqua-mart.com to shop for all your needs. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Dripworks, Rise Gardens, Grip6, Bloomin' Easy, Fleet Farm, Waltons Incorporated, Blue Ribbon Organics, Tree Diaper. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your day. Farm Defense, products in which will help your harvesting go easier and make you safer. Yeah, you want a farm and garden in the ultimate comfort. Farmer's Defense has lightweight and durable sleeves to protect you against the elements while farming. Farmer sleeves are often unparalleled. They offer unparalleled protection of arms and skin for any farmer, gardener, or outdoor worker. Their sleeves are cooling, 
comfort, protection against the elements, and outdoors. You can say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. An alternative to thick clothing, Farmer's Defense is made of wicking material with UBF protection factor 50 plus to protect you from allergens and scratches. To find all their great products and more, visit FarmersDefense.com. Now, the key to all gardeners who have gardens is to get the most out of their garden, to do get the most production possible. And essentially doing it with the least amount of effort, not overworking the garden, not overworking yourself, but getting a good return on the investment of your garden. Right. So you want to, I guess, work garden smarter, not harder. Okay. So um, one way you can get the most production out of your garden this year, and as we come upon Memorial Day, which in a lot of growing more northern growing zones is when a lot of people start to think about planting so one thing you can do over the next uh, couple weekends is think about your soil so maybe you want to add some compost to your soil or you want to add some organic matter and then this way will help keep your soil fertilized and fed throughout the season buy in bulk buy in bulk yes yeah. so if you want if you say you want to refresh your garden beds you might want to consider getting um, some compost delivered. Maybe you are the type of person that uses some sort of um, animal manure. You want to consider, you know, what you're, how you're going to obtain that, where it's coming from, etc. You want to kind of start to prepare now. Blue Ribbon Organics in the Milwaukee area is a great source for bulk material. And it, you don't have to work it into your garden. You can simply top dress or apply a couple of inches on top of where you're at uh, in your garden. Now, if there are weeds that are exposing themselves th uh, out of the ground, then you do want to remove them because it, it's just easier and not have to fight them coming through the compost because some of them will. In, in doing that, you can – and weeding – that's our next one in order to improve the garden, whether weeding before adding the compost or weeding throughout the growing season. Weeds are much more vigorous and more aggressive than the vegetables and the fruits in which you're trying to grow. Right. So, yeah, you want to you want to weed. You want another thing about weeding is, as Joy mentioned, they're vigorous. But then also because they are taking up things from the soil, they're taking things from the soil and from your plants. So you want to think about how they could also be crowding the roots and or robbing the soil of nutrients. Yes. And weeding, it just, weeding doesn't mean going in and ripping the top of the plant off and going, hey, it's not there anymore. Roots of these weeds are designed to regrow and continue to fight for survival. So even if you pull part of the root out of a dandelion or a wire grass or a piece of fescue, there are many different uh, roots underneath the soil that are going to regenerate a new top growth. So proper removal of roots can greatly reduce the amount of weeds in which you're going to have. Now, you're going to have blow in, you're going to have drift in, you're going to have birds drop, you're going to have all this stuff uh, additional. But preventing the weeds on your end will greatly reduce it. It also, also, um, yeah, it will re reduce the weed problems. But one thing you want to keep in mind is that, like I said, we, weeds are taken from things in the soil. Right. But also with watering. So when you water, you are feeding everything in your soil, including the weeds. So when you're watering, you want to water properly. You want to water timely and thoroughly. thoroughly. Yep. So when you're watering, you might think, okay, I'm going to make sure I spray at the root of my plants and I'm going to do each plant for four seconds or whatever and sometimes that's not enough you have to think about coming back and rewatering and then also especially if in containers sometimes you might water till it runs out the bottom of the container and then you want to come back and do that again and you might have to do that twice a day during the peak parts of summer you got to recharge the soil most of the soil a lot of times that i have seen in our raised beds that if you water and you haven't watered for a long time, the soil is hydrophobic. It rejects the water. It causes the water to run away and doesn't absorb, or it will absorb very minimal, minimal amount of water. So you think you've watered a lot. You go over and scrape the top half inch off. It's bone dry. So that's why you want to consistently water, whether you use a tree hugger sprinkler, a tree diaper, or a irrigation system from dripworks.com in order to have that constant moisture 
in your garden so you can always have moisture at the roots. And whenever we're talking about weeding, often people will weed by tilling. Again, tilling chops up those roots, and now instead of seven plants or seven weeds you have in that area, now you've got 215 because that the tines of the tiller have chopped up these particles and it looks pretty right now but in two and a half weeks it is a football field of grass turf because all of these weeds have regenerated from root follicles and are covering your garden even more intensely than they were before right and then yep so i remember i had a friend who was a a religious uh, tiller and he you know he tilled his garden his parents till their garden their parents till their garden and when i explained to him that you are chopping up these weeds and they're propagating themselves and he's like yeah but i thought that you know you till the weeds into the soil and that's take that takes care of them and i'm like yeah for 10 days oh i mean basically. there's right <laughs> yeah. now we can we will remove the weeds and then put the weeds on top of the soil to create a mulch layer and expose the roots in order in order for them to die some people will spade the small ones over and that will that will kill them that way uh watering plant the things at the right time of year people often want to plant cucumbers very early in the season and cucumbers require a root temperature of 65 degrees or more consistent in order to develop and grow correctly. People want to throw them in very early and think, oh, I'm going to get cucumbers, and the plants do not like that, and they have difficulty producing the, the cucumbers that you're wanting. Plant the things at the right time. Tomatoes too early, you're going to fight the cold. You're going to fight the cold soil. You are going to deal with frost or frigid temperatures. Temp tomatoes do not like temperatures below 50 degrees. Now, t they won't die, but they are you're stunning them. You're causing problems. Wait until the soil is 50, 55 degrees consistent, and then put the tomatoes in. Being the first person to have a tomato on the block, on in the neighborhood, at the church social, there's a lot, a lot of extra work that you're putting into in order to get that first tomato. Just wait and do it at the more appropriate time, and then you won't have as many stressors in the garden, plant radishes and and uh, lettuces and, and spinaches in the spring and in the fall. Don't try to grow them during the summer where they won't grow hardly at all. They will strictly go to seed because of the heat and the day length. So knowing what to plant and when to plant it can greatly increase the productivity of the garden because you're planting them when they are designed by nature to grow. Absolutely. And then so let's talk about shade versus sun. And this can be a key factor. A lot of people don't realize that they are either not providing enough sun to certain plants or they're basically Over. cooking yeah. cooking their plants, certain plants. So there are different crops, especially there's a little saying that if it's green, um, if you grow up for the fruit or the root, it needs full sun. If you grow up for the green, it can be in the, the partial shade. So when we're talking about partial shade, we're not talking about that weird back corner of your garden that gets like one minute of sunshine when the sun is coming up. We're talking about like, I don't know, four to six hours. Right. As minimum. opposed to eight to 12. Right. Minimum four to six hours mm -hmm. of sunlight. And by doing that, you are going, the plants are, are certain plants like that partial shade. Other plants can tolerate partial shade. But those plants that tolerate partial shade, beets, green beans, tom uh, cherry tomatoes, they are not going to grow as rapidly. They will produce, but not grow as rapidly. That's why people will say, oh, I got partial shade. I'm growing cherry tomatoes because it doesn't take as much energy to produce the cherries versus the big beefsteaks, the brandy wines, the uh, mortgage lifters, uh, the purple uh, brandy or the purple uh, black crims. So be aware of what you're planting when you are planting and where you are planting. Take a little time, do a little research, and figure out. Now, if things have always worked the way that, you know, you've always had success doing this for 37 years and your grandmother's had success for it for 417 years, we'll keep doing it. But for most of us, things don't work the way you want them to if they're not designed to work that way. And that's something that you had to learn. I had to teach you yes. that we had to feed the soil. Not the plants. Because and, I came from an agricultural background right. where you fed the soil. The, the soil was the media. It was just a, a holding place for the you crops. You fed the plants. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. You, put, you right. pumped the fertilizer yeah. in the field and the plants fed the fur, off the fertilizer and the medium was just the soil. The soil was dead. 
Uh, and this was a non-organic agricultural background. Organic cultural, uh, organic farming, the soil is the, the, the feed for the plants. And the, the, it grows there and it feeds off the soil. So, yes, you have to keep that in mind. Yeah. So you want to keep in mind that it's important to, yes, you may have done things one way, but as you learn things and continue on, you can make changes, you can make tweaks, you can try new things and you don't have to try new things in your whole entire garden. You can always just designate one area to see how you like it, but it is always a learning process. If you want to control beetles and grubs invaders without affecting the rest of your ecosystem in your yard, then grub gone and beetle gone are the solution. Phylum's Grub Gone and Beetle Gone target a wide range of invasive and destructive beetles, weevils, borers without harming non-targets such as bees, ladybugs, butterflies, earthworms, or other beneficial insects. You can purchase from these products locally in Massachusetts at Ward's, Ward's Nursery, McHugh Garden Center, Hyannis Country Gardens, in Connecticut at Van Williams Garden Center, in Maine at Salisbury Organics, and in New York at Fadigan's Nursery, and in Ohio at Berlin Seeds. If you go to phylumbioproducts.com, you can find all the information there. You want to target the pest, not the rest. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. Hang out with us when we come back. Angela Ferrero Fanning will be with us. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Going on vacation and can't find a plant sitter? Check out Tree Diaper. It can provide perfect soil moisture for plants for weeks, even months. Use coupon code GARDEN15 to save 15% off at treediaper.com. Chapin has the tools for planting your garden and keeping it growing all season long. Whether your garden is big or small, Chapin has sprayers and spreaders for fertilizing, weed, and pest control, watering, and seeding. You can find Chapin products at your local hardware store, big box retailer. You may visit them also online at ChapinMFG.com to learn more and buy online. Fleet Farms Garden Center is now open. Stop in to check out their selection of nursery quality plants available at low prices. All of their plants are grown in the Midwest, and their vegetables are incesticide-free. Choose from annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, and more. Plus, take care of your lawn with grass seed fertilizers, lawnmowers, and string trimmers. Get everything you need to keep your yard looking great at Fleet Farm, your lawn and garden headquarters. Wisconsin Greenhouse Company has custom-made greenhouses to suit your needs. Grow year-round. Strongest greenhouses that will last a lifetime. From agricultural to lounging to entertaining. For more information, go to wisconsingreenhousecompany.com. Ah, spring, the season of renewal, an unexpected house guest, none the worse perhaps than ants. And I'm not talking about great Aunt Mabel. When you need to get rid of ants fast, you need rescue ant baits. Rescue ant baits are pre-baited, child-resistant, and ready to use right out of the box. No sticky liquid, no mess. Made in the USA by the makers of the popular Rescue Fly and Yellow Jacket Traps. Learn more at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E dot C-O-M. There are a lot of plants, but few we eat. It's time for this week's Garden Fun Fact. There are over 20,000 species of edible plants in the world. However, just 20 species of those plants provide 90% of humans' food. A non-selective herbicide that is USDA certified? Yep, No More Weeds by Naturally Green Products. The same great company that brings you no more bugs. No More Weeds kills weeds with no harsh chemicals and no glyphosate. No More Weeds is a commercial grade vinegar base with a proprietary sticking agent. Great around pools, decks, patios, and more. Visit natgreenproducts.com. Free shipping on orders over $50 using code free ship for me. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Happy Leaf LED. Root Maker, Jung Seeds, Tree Hugger Sprinklers, Verlo Mattresses, Farmer's Defense, Pomona Universal Pectin, Natural Green Products, Mantis Tillers. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Moments away, Angela Ferrero Fanning will be with us. But first, a word from our good friends at Rise Gardens. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home 
Instead of food traveling hundreds or even thousands of miles before it hits your plate, harvest the veggies, herbs, and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your home. No green thumb required knowledge. Gardening made easy with the Rise Garden app. Simple step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest. A complete garden on a shelf and comes with everything you need to grow healthy and the freshest food for you and your loved ones. Fully customizable your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information, you can get your Rise Garden. Visit risegardens.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Angela is the farmer and content creator behind Axe and Root Homestead. She is also the author and blogger. Her book, The Sustainable Homestead, Create a Thriving Permaculture Ecosystem for Your Garden, Animals, and Land, just came out in March. Welcome to the program, Angela. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us, not only educating Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. And I want to start with this question. Was homesteading something you knew you always wanted to do, or how did you get into this, or was this something like a happy accident in life and you you found out you loved it? A happy accident is a good way to put it. (laughs) I had no experience in farming. I don't come from a farming family. It was not on my radar not when I was in high school, college, nor when I pursued my own graphic and website design career and then had my own business. It actually wasn't until after I had my first child that I wanted to quit the daily grind, get out from behind the computer, and do something that felt real more raw and and tangible to me. And that's how I kind of found homesteading. And when you're a homesteader or you're an independent contractor, some people may label that being You have nobody to answer to but yourself, and if it doesn't get done, you didn't do it. Absolutely right. It's a very demanding job, um, and it's also an addictive job because the more skills that you learn and the sense of accomplishment that comes with accomplishing tasks and learning that you certainly can do things kind of segues into trying to figure out how to do other things, and so it snowballs before you know it. So while it is hard work, it's also very rewarding work. Fantastic. Now, mining people might not know what permaculture is. What is it? And maybe some examples, but also what is our common average ways that the home gardener might be already practicing permaculture and not even realize it? Sure. So permaculture really just stands for literally permanent agriculture. And what it is, uh, it's a way to farm or or garden in alignment with nature and also in a way that mimics patterns that already exist in nature. So ways that people might be doing this already that they don't think about is with companion planting. Many gardeners are very familiar with the concept of companion planting and using flowers, herbs, or other crops even to help their main crop attract beneficial insects and repel unwanted ones, and in some cases, even disease. And so that would be a way that Mother Nature in the wild, if you think about in a forest or in a meadow, would sort of put different plants together that actually help one another out. Another common one is fruit tree guilds. Um, This is gaining more popularity. You wouldn't just plant an apple tree and stick it in the ground. You'd actually surround that apple tree with helpers and create a little neighborhood, an ecosystem of plants that not only repel and attract the desired insects, but also absorb nutrients from the soil, fix nitrogen, keep the soil cool, retain moisture, that sort of thing. Those are all things that already exist in Mother Nature. So with planting things around a fruit tree, I, I'm assuming there's specific uh, requirements that that plant needs based on the shade uh, availability that the fruit trees are producing. That's absolutely right. Um, one thing that I did in my book, The Sustainable Homestead, was sort of create these recipes where the members of your fruit tree guild are going to differ if you're planting an apple versus a fig versus a pear or even a cherry or something like a blueberry or a raspberry or a blackberry, they all have their own needs, right? And so we want to make sure that we're supplying them with the right friends or beneficial helpers to really maximize their growth habit in the soil that they're in. And I think you've seen it and we've seen it that we as gardeners and homesteaders, we think we know better than Mother Nature does. And we're going to do it this way. And why did that not work? And we've done it four years this way. And we're going to try it one more time. You're absolutely right. I mean, if you go down a sidewalk in New York City, you can see that Mother Nature will always win because there's weeds popping up in the cracks. Right. But I think the other thing that people really are sort of um, 
at fault for is that we take a look at what other people are doing in their gardens, especially on social media and in Pinterest. And what we need to remember is what works for somebody else in their own yard or garden, even if it's right across the street, isn't necessarily going to work for us. Because even though our growing zones could even be the same, our microclimates are different. The grade of the land, whether that be an upward or a downhill slope, how much water retention we have, we have those things are going to be different. The shade that your maple tree might cast is going to cause a difference in sun than what your neighbor has in their own yard. So really, we just need to get back to looking at what we have right in front of us, put the blinders on, put the earplugs in, and just really try to focus and hone in on your own space. And oftentimes on those social media sites, they don't post the failures. They only post the pretty things. Yep, that's true. That's so very true. Your book, uh, The Sustainable Homestead, you mentioned it moments ago. Tell us uh, more about it and something that you're that's in it that would intrigue our listeners to definitely go pick up a cop- copy. Sure. So The Sustainable Homestead is the resource I wish that I had when I started my homestead. And it goes beyond just soil health. There's obviously a chapter dedicated to that. It goes beyond growing and companion planting and those orchard gills that we, we talked about before with your fruit trees. Um, it really also takes to, con- to consideration the things that you need to keep in mind when assessing your own plot of land or your own site. So really not only understanding and conducting nutrient soil tests and trying to figure out your weather patterns and your microclimate, but also understanding, okay, how are animals in nature going to play a role in this? Certainly when it comes to the garden, you wouldn't want to plant things that are just going to be a feast for deer. Or if you're keeping chickens or ducks or other livestock on your property, I have chapter, chapters talking about how could you feed them while also feeding the soil. Grass is great, but it really doesn't do anything for the soil other than perform erosion control, right? It doesn't right. give any nutrients to the soil. So how can we feed the soil while meet the needs of the animals? And so there's a lot of information in there on that. And then I also discuss discuss composting because if you have animals and if you have a garden, you're going to have waste. And so we can take that waste and we can make it work for us. And so really a a lot of the things that nature does, it works smarter. And so we just kind of have to get back to that. Like you mentioned before, we're never going to outsmart nature. We need to harness the principles that are already there so we can work smarter and not harder and work in alignment with nature and not against it. Right. Absolutely. So we were talking with Angela, the farmer content creator behind Axe and Root Homestead, author and blogger. So cover crops seem to be the new gardening buzzword. What are they and what are some good ones? And maybe should everybody be utilizing them, even a smaller home gardener? Sure. So cover crops are essentially crops that are grown in your garden or in your pasture animal grazing spaces that you grow for the sole purpose of feeding the soil. I mentioned before, I simultaneously grow some to feed my animals, but you wouldn't want to necessarily want to grow something like a forage turnip and then think you're going to harvest the turnips and eat them. The whole point would be to use a forage turnip to help break up soil compaction because as that radish or that turnip grows and sends down that tap root and widens the soil around it, it's going to break up compaction. And so we want to leave that in there, not only during its growth period, but also allow it to die in place so that it can return the nutrients to the soil. So we want to think of cover crops as soil helpers and leaving them in place. One really great cover crop not many folks know about is sweet alyssum, which you can plant in your garden and is great for attracting bees and beneficial insects. But once the season is finished, don't pull it. Turn it back into the soil. It acts as a green manure or a nutrient fixer into your soil. It's going to add all of those nutrients back in plus more. And so it's really good also to create more organic matter. And uh, cover crops can be grown in the spring, in the summer, in the fall. And in some places, they can be grown in the winter to cover the soil as nature has covered the soil because we don't want to leave soil bare. Soil doesn't like right. to be left bare. Right. So here in the mid-Atlantic, in the fall, I think it was late November, I planted bursting clover, red clover, and hairy vetch in my raised bed gardens. They had enough time to germinate, sprout, and get established, and they stayed green all winter long. And then come spring, I just turned them into the soil by hand. 
Um, and in some other beds that also created a little mobile rabbit run, which I dubbed the bun run. And the bunnies <laughs> went through and grazed all the cover crops out for me. And then I was able to just plant. Well, we like asking this next question to people because we learn from mistakes. What is a mm-hmm. huge mistake you know uh, a lot of homesteaders make that really you yourself ha- have avoided it or, or you try to avoid it? So I absolutely have a mistake that some folks will try to debate about because there's a nuance to it, and that's using hay in your garden as a mulch. So a lot of folks are familiar with the concept of covering soil. We do that to retain moisture and prevent solarization and erosion. We don't want any nutrients to escape. And so we can use straw as a great mulcher, but people assume that hay is very similar. We can use that too, but here's the thing. Straw is from the stem of the grass blade, and hay includes the seed head. So my own mistake, the nearby farm and nursery was out of straw. So I thought this first year that I was doing this, excellent, that's fine. They have hay. I'm going to use that. I very quickly turned into a grass farmer. Mm -hmm. All of the seed heads uh, just planted themselves into the garden spaces and it took over and it was very difficult to garden that year. Weeding was near impossible. And so the nuance is if you do want to use hay, it needs to be well rotted. We're talking, it needs to have had exposure to animal urine, feces. It needs to have been uh, where the seed heads have maybe been trampled, walked over, no longer are there. And then you can take that hay And this is assuming that there is no required decomposition point that, you know, you would have an animal that would contain pathogens, then you would be able to use it in your garden space. So I always tell folks, hey, just steer clear of it altogether, just use straw. So whenever you uh, made this mistake, are you, were you able to undo it eventually or did you just move the garden to a place and start it over? That's a good question. No, I'm still gardening in the same place. It took years. That first season initially was horrible, and I'm still pulling grass that I don't think I probably would have had had I not used it that first year. And there may be some people that would go, hey, we're just, we've are we made this mistake. We're just going to spray it with a weed killer, let it set a year, and then re- regrow in it. That, mm-hmm. I guess, in some people's minds may be may work, but for organic gardeners and people who understand what those chemicals can do, that's not an option as it was not for you. Correct. Yeah, I'm a no-till farmer, organic gardener. So for me, pulling that root ball out by hand is the best and only way to go. And you got some feed for the animals uh, with weeds if you really have to look at it that way. That's true. Well, we've really enjoyed having you on the program. How can people find out more about your great information and your book? Oh, thank you so much for having me. So this book in particular is called The Sustainable Homestead. I also wrote a series for families, and it's also illustrated for children. It's called The Little Homesteader Series. Um, All of these books are available on Amazon or anywhere, such as Barnes & Noble, anywhere books are sold. But if you're looking to find me online, my website address and all of my social media handles, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram is Axe and Root Homestead. So that's A-X-E. A and D root homestead and you'll find me there. Well, Angela, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day, not only to educate high myself, but all of our listeners. We thank you for the time you've given us. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And when we come back, it's your garden questions, our garden answers. You're tuned in to the gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to garden talk radio at gmail.com. dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position step twist pull and plant visit proplugger.com dripping springs oyas clay pot irrigation solves the watering needs for gardens bushes new trees and more an ancient irrigation system we brought to america dripping springs oyas o-l-l-a-s on youtube facebook instagram check us out Wind River Chimes creates a symphony in any space. Chimes that are inspired by nature and designed to make the natural world even more inspiring. Music speaks to everyone. Individually handcrafted in Virginia for over 35 years and hand-tuned for an exceptional precision and lasting beauty. Because in life, the winds of change are always moving. But no matter where they carry you, Wind River Chimes will always be the inspiring harmony. With a large selection and customization options, you will find the sound that soothes you. Visit windriverchimes.com to shop and find out more. 
Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit rootmaker.com and use coupon code radio23 to save 15% off your order at rootmaker.com. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again over apply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to MySoilSavvy.com. Tree hugger sprinklers are the ultimate watering device for either your newly planted or established trees and shrubs. Our sprinklers open and close around the trunk of your tree and provide 360 degrees of watering. With our adjustable valve, you can direct the water to your tree's targeted saturation zone. They come in three sizes, 7, 11, and 15 inches. You can purchase a tree hugger sprinkler at your local garden center, feed store, or hardware store. Go to treehuggersprinklers.com to find a retailer close to you. Or you can buy it directly from Amazon or treehuggersprinklers.com. If you're an independent nursery garden center hardware store or feed store you will want to stock this product contact the good people at tree hugger sprinklers and they will get you set up your tree's best friend treehuggersprinklers.com the gardening with join holly radio show is brought to you by the following chapin manufacturing incorporated aqua dash mart soil savvy wind river chimes wisconsin greenhouse company pro plugger deer defeat Dripping Springs Oyas, Phylum Bioproducts. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Hollywood Radio Show. Happy you've taken time out of your day to join us on the program, whether you're listening to us live on one of the 20 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2023 or podcast replay, in-studio video replay. Thank you. It's time for question and answers. If you've got a question, we can probably get you an answer to your question. If you want to submit that, you can do that in two different ways. You can go to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Send us an email, gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call toll-free, coast-to-coast at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. This question is sponsored by Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com. I have one pumpkin plant growing and it's getting kind of big, but I recently had just one small pumpkin growing and it broke off. I'm new to this, but I haven't been watering it very well, but also I live in Texas. I'm going to try to start watering it more, but any tips on how to make it grow stronger? Watering, okay. watering is, helps. Is yeah. The best. yeah. Keep water consistently to the roots, whether you're in Texas, Alabama, or New York, Wisconsin, water is the key here. Secondly, pumpkins, zucchini, Watermelon, fill in the blank fruit or vegetable. If it knows it can't sustain the fruit or the vegetable on it, it will drop it off. Pumpkins are notoriously known for producing seven or eight flowers and starting to put on seven or eight pumpkins, and then they will kick off or, bra- or dry up several of them. So you you and you only have one or two really nice pumpkins. So by that's just a natural thing. So. Focus and look at once you've got a pumpkin established or a watermelon or cantaloupe or honeydew, find two or maybe at the very most three that look really good and then go ahead and cut the other ones off. I know it's painful, but go ahead and cut and the other fruits that are trying to develop off so all the energy can be focused to that one plant or that with that one fruit or that other one or two pumpkins so you have really nice pumpkins in the fall or harvest watermelons or cantaloupe, whatever they may be. Uh, you can also uh, put good compost around the base of the pumpkin. As you water, the nutrients will go down. And pumpkins will also send off roots along their vine. Whenever you pick a pumpkin up, it's going to be attached to the ground with roots. So you could also you know, put a little soil around that too. It's not required, but also now you're trying to grow two pumpkins. You don't want to invest $83 in compost and compost teas and fertilizers to try to grow right. two pumpkins right. that you could buy at the supermarket for six bucks. Okay. So, yeah, we want to grow what we want. We want to try to grow it, but we have to be logical about this as well. All right. Next question here is the phone call. We had a phone call come in from Boston. They listened to us on WCRN 830 AM. Uh, she did not leave her name, but let's see what she has to uh, say. 
just wanted to ask the question. I enjoy the show very much, listen to it every week. And the question is, should eggplants be planted deep, uh, you know, when you transplant, similar to t- tomatoes, which you stated they should be planted a little deeper? Also, um, another question, I'd like to know where to buy rock fate, not fertilizer, but uh, straight, you know, just rock fate. And also, I'm not clear on when you say um, Jones seeds or junk seeds. So I'm not sh- uh when you make when you uh, advertise that, I'm not sure what what words you're using. So if you could clarify that. And like I say, thank you very much for your show. It's it's wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Well, thank you for calling in. Thank you for the kind words on the program. With eggplants, no, you don't want to plant them any deeper than what they are in the container, whether you've started it or you have uh, bought it from a con- uh, in, a, in a container. If you plant it deeper, and this is the same for peppers, even though tomatoes, peppers, eggplants are all in the nightshade family, peppers may fractionally put a few more roots on right above where the soil line is. It's not, if you plant them too deep, they're going to rot. Same things with eggplants, just plant them in the depth in which they were in the container. Tomatoes, you can plant very, very deep, and the hairs on the stem of the tomatoes have the opportunity to put on roots. Also, Jung Seeds, J U N G S E E D dot com, Jung Seeds, uh, Jung Seed at. And you can use coupon code 10TG23. Uh, right. T- say that again. 10TG23. To save 10%. To save 10%, per, 10% off your order at jungseed.com. J-U-N-G-C.com. Yep. There you go. And then you also, she also had a question about. The Rock Fates. Rock Fates, yes. So you can find that at most local garden centers. It looks like they come in five pound bags. So okay. you just go to your local garden center. Yeah, I would, I would recommend independent. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. At least, at least they would know. A big box store may carry it, but they don't care. They don't care whether right. you buy it or not. All right. So then we have another uh, question yeah, that came in. Ed, Ed from uh, Yankton, South Dakota, asked if planting carrots and onions next to each other, if there's a problem with those, if they are a companionship in the garden or enemies. Well, they're not either. They're not best friends, but they're not enemies either. Maybe they're frenemies. You can, um, you can plant but those. You can, yeah, you can plant them next to each other. It's no problem. At all. So that's a, a good choice and thank will you, Ed, not, for not uh, call, cause issues. Yep. All right. Are you finding that tomatoes, cucumbers, pepper plants are much more costly this year? Also, flowers and shrubs, trees uh, seem to have doubled. Is this true in your area? Uh, yes. Uh, it, we had an article come out in the local uh, uh, TV station here, and they were sh- saying that uh, everything has basically gone up. Uh, garden supply is up fifteen uh, percent. Cost of fertilizer has tripled, and uh, we all have our own thoughts of why this is occurring. Whether it's politically motivated, whether it uh, has other uh, reasonings behind it, or if it's a combination of all many factors. But yes, m- everything has gone up. Seedlings are going to cost more this year. Fertilizer is going to cost this more. Everything, food across the board. So what we are planning on doing is we only have we didn't we planted a lot of tomatoes and they didn't all grow the way I wanted them to grow inside. So we have mm, about 20 less tomatoes than what we had anticipated. So we're going to pull a a playbook card from Holly's uh, past. Explain for people who've heard this or haven't oh heard this. Oh my goodness. I didn't realize this would be such a big deal. This is a big deal, at least to me and maybe okay. a lot of our listeners. They've never heard that this can be done, especially so, with these vegetables. Growing up, growing up in the city, um, we would just plant the seeds Memorial Day weekend. So that was everything. That was uh, zucchini. That was tomatoes. You didn't know peppers. what a plant start was. No. When I first met you and you're like, I got my seeds started. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Why are you growing them in this tiny little greenhouse? Not realizing that you were going to transplant them. Mm-hmm. I thought that you were. That was their home forever. Very- good at gardening. Okay. <laughs> Joke's on you. <laughs> Apparently. So yeah, we just threw them in the ground. I mean, don't just throw them in the ground, plant them nicely. And then by August, we usually had everything. So well, yeah. whenever you look in the back of the package, it says days to harvest. That is whenever you put it in the ground, not when you start it in the seed cell. So if you started tomatoes that take 85 days, it's days to harvest is from the time you take that transplant and put it in the ground, 85 days start then. Or you take that seed, 
85 days starts then. So the starting point is the same. The size of the plant is different. The only benefit, I mean, there's multiple benefits to this. You, you save space indoors and you don't have to go through the process of hardening off your plants. The plants get naturally hardened off as they grow in the garden. So you did the, and peppers, I wouldn't advise this on peppers. Peppers are incredibly slow growing, but apparently it worked for you. Uh, that peppers did the same thing. They, they, yeah, grew. I don't think they got very big, but no. they did work. Yeah. But tomatoes are more rapidly growing. So we're going to take, when we run out of starts from our indoor grow room, we are going to just go straight to the seed. And just like you would in your seed starting tray, I am going to plant three tomato plants, three seeds in a hole with the, uh, with at least one coming up. And if all three comes up, and they all three are like really, really great, then I'll, I will gently sort them out and move them around and um, maximize our tomato uh, growing. We've got good eggplants and good peppers. We just didn't have the number of tomatoes. We didn't plant enough. Yeah, we should probably should have planted more, but that's okay. Uh, so there, there's your handy garden tip of the week. You can just put the seed in the ground and you can get your seeds from jungseed.com, J-U-N-G-S-E-E-D.com and save 10% by using coupon code 10TG23 and get all the seeds you want. You don't have to worry about your plant starts. So uh, next question here now that we've uh, surprised a lot of people on that. Okay, so is there such a thing as too many mushrooms being a bad thing? I have a ton growing in my container with my bell pe peppers. It's not a bad thing per se, but maybe you could be overwatering. Or if you live in a high moisture area, they, they might just naturally occur. But if you mulch, it could help reduce them. Reduce them, and they're only going to be around for... 48, 72, 96 hours, and they are going to produce some shade on the soil if you're not mulching, and you should be mulching even your containers, you should mulch. Mulch for your containers can be pine straw, can be shredded paper, it can be sand. You can go to the beach and get uh, and just put a half inch of, of sand on top of the containers because what's underneath sand at the beach? Moisture. More sand. More sand, but it's wet sand. <laughs> it is wet sand. It's wet sand. Yeah. Um, and you can use all types of uh, natural mulch around your containers, uh, straw, uh, chemical-free, seed-free grass clippings, but certainly uh, mulch your containers because no matter the size of your container, it's going to dry out quicker than in the ground. And the smaller the container, the less soil mass, the faster it's going to dry out. And the sooner you're going to have a dead plant because you may not remember to hydrate it. All right. Should I pinch off the flowers of my potato plants? Well, I no. Um, it, the, you, well, you it, this is controversial. It is controversial. It's kind of like a, a do... Do what feels right for you type of thing. Some people yeah, Should you like cut to... suckers off a tomato right. or not? You know, get your boxing gloves on and go at it. So some people like to do it. Some people don't. It will put energy possibly back into developing larger potatoes, um, but it's not but if you pinch the But if you pinch the flowers off, which p potato flowers are very pretty. They're pink ones and, and white ones and yellow ones. If you pinch the flowers off your potato plant, are you going to gain a half pound more potatoes? Are you going to gain so minuscule amount of ounces that it's not worth the effort to go through and pinch the flowers off your 37 plants. And certainly these agricultural fields, they're not pinching flowers off of their plants. Now, Yukon uh, ya gold potatoes are, pr are more prevalently uh, known for putting on seed po uh, pods or little looking like green tomatoes that contain pure real potato seeds. If you remove the flowers from that, I, I, I'm drawing a blank, but I don't know if that's actually going to prevent those from occurring or not. Um, but you can, there are people that will get those and then start potatoes from true seed rather than tubers that we're all very familiar with doing. It is a challenge. Some people are successful at it. Don't eat those. Those are very high level of toxicity and you don't want to mess with those. Well, with that being said, we are out of time and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it? Hey, you can do that by going to the our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com and clicking on the season seven tab at the top of the page. Or you can send us an email to Garden Talk Radio at Gmail dot com and we will send you a link to this program. Tune in next week to the program where we'll be discussing mosquitoes what to do, and how to keep them away, as well as the world of beans, bush beans, pole beans, and dry beans. Our guest 
next week is uh, Christy Purifoy, as well as we'll answer your garden questions. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs> <laughs>